Okay, well, um, this afternoon I wanted to try in 18 minutes to combine the practical with the profound and to reveal the obvious in the unseen. So um, I was going to do this session without any slides at all uh, because I wanted to kind of take you on a journey and then I realized, but wait, there's some quite pragmatic, concrete things that I want to share with you. And so the slides are there to assist you with that, but not to distract you from w what I'm saying, okay? Uh, concretely today, I'm going to talk about um, a concept from Sociocracy 3.0. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it's basically a menu of behavior patterns that you can observe emergent in collaboration over time and persisting because of their usefulness in certain contexts. And to take that out of the very complicated phrase I just said, for example, delegating influence to people in what we call roles, right? That's a pattern. We do it everywhere, yeah, because it's useful, okay? So that's one example. Um, so uh, I wanted to talk about a key concept from S3, Social Oxy 3.0, which is drivers. Um, can you raise your hand if you've heard of the concept driver from Social Oxy 3.0? So, some of you, okay. So I want to just clarify for those who don't know what, what we mean by that, and also to offer you some insight into how to describe drivers, and that will make more sense as we go. The other thing is, on the topic of decision-making, okay, um, is how do we make and evolve agreements, harnessing collective intelligence, to achieve the best we possibly can with what we have, and then act on that and learn from it, and iterate and evolve things incrementally. There's so much investment into agile operations, yeah, like billions and billions and billions, but agile governance, agile decision making at the organizational level, applying that same mindset, well, this is, a, this is an emergent realization among organizations that that might be a valuable thing to do. It's kind of like the antidote to waterfall governance. Right? So, and on top of that, I want to reveal what's underneath all of that, like what's under the hood behind these things. So let's see how it goes, okay? Um, driver. I stopped. Okay, good. A driver, the motive for responding to a situation, okay? When we say driver, it's a difficult word because it's like, what's that, like driving the bus or something? It doesn't translate into Swedish, and it doesn't even work in English because there isn't actually a word to describe what I'm talking about. So to take you behind what we mean, a driver is a combination of perception of something happening in the world in a given context that matters to the person or people perceiving it. Yeah, a driver, perception of something happening in the world, might not be true, but it's a perception of, yeah, occurring in a certain context that matters to somebody or a group of people who are perceiving it. Okay? And all you do as a human being from birth to death is identify, categorize, prioritize drivers and respond accordingly. That's all we do. We're like driver spotting entities. Yeah? Our whole system is set up to do that. Um, so why... Is this a concept we have in S3? Well, it's a useful concept because if you see something happening that you think matters in a certain context, one, it's useful for you to be able to understand what that might be and what it might mean. And secondarily, if you need to communicate it to others, it's useful to have some way of doing it. Yeah? And so we have been exploring with S3, like how do you summarize something like that? How do you summarize this? thing happening in a given context that matters, or maybe matters, okay? Um, and you can break down a driver summary into approximately two pieces. One is to talk about what's happening, like objectively. It's like, okay, the water spilled on the floor. It's like something objective. Um, and secondarily, to talk about what might be needed. There's water on the floor. Maybe it needs removing from the floor, for example, yeah? Um, and if you take that on another layer of granularity, you can also then further break down the what's happening part in terms of the situation, so the objective situation that's occurring, and the effect or the anticipated effect of that situation on the organization. Yeah. So if you think of this in a... Um, I often hear people give examples of, oh, well, people aren't taking responsibility. And it's like, so what? 
Why does that matter? It's like, that doesn't tell me anything, right? It just tells me people aren't taking responsibility. It's not even that objective, right? <laughs> but if someone says, you know what? Last week, 50% of the essential work that needed doing on the backlog was not done, and the consequence of that was we lost half of our customers this week, right? Now I know what's happening concretely, objectively, and I know what the effect of that is and why it matters, okay? And that's going to help me with categorization and prioritization of that situation. Um, anticipated effect, because sometimes it hasn't happened yet, but you see something happening and you think, hmm, the consequences of that might be really bad, or hmm, the consequences of that might be really cool if we interact with that situation in some way. And on the other side is um, what's needed, right? And when I say what's needed, I often hear people arguing, well, we need to do A and we need to do B, right? But when you get into those kind of arguments, you're too much in the strategy space. Okay, in the solution space. But if you zoom out a bit and say, okay, well, what's the thing that's deficit that were we to do A or B would help to change that situation to achieve the kind of impact that we would want to see? Yeah? When you zoom out far enough, you arrive at that point where the person arguing for A and the person arguing for B says, okay, well, I can agree with you on that. And that is so important because as human beings, we are limited in our perceptions, you know? We, we, we have different facts, right? And, and it's good to be humble about that and recognize it. And when we're trying to navigate complexity, it's like, you don't know what's happening, really, actually. You can just see certain things occurring, right? And you can be more or less accurate about what those things are. So being able to converse with others and say, hey, look, do you see this too? It looks approximately like this, and I think that's the effect, or it could be, and what do you think, and what do you think's needed, and what kind of impact might we want to make on the current state of the universe, so it appears up in a different way tomorrow, yeah, is a very useful mechanism to have. Drivers is a, is a really useful mechanism, and there's two patterns in S3. One is describe organizational drivers, and the other one is respond to them <laughs> according to your priorities. So um, drivers can be problem-focused or solution-focused, and usually you can look at a situation either way. Yeah, there's going to be optimists in the room. It's like, oh, everything's fine, and it's all going to turn out great. It's an opportunity. And there'll be those who are more pessimistic and say, this is a damn big problem, and if we don't do something in a minute, we're screwed. You know? And both are valuable perspectives, and how you describe a driver depends on the context you're in and the impact that you want to have. Right. Sometimes it helps to give an optimist a slap and say, yeah, well, maybe, mate, but the reality right now is it's not looking good. And conversely, someone who's more pessimistic to support them in seeing how they could have a better tomorrow. So um, a couple of examples just to make it concrete. This is from a, a customers of ours. So one is ambiguity on how we contract, track, time, and bill leads to perception of unfairness by people inside and out, okay? This was a consultancy company, and this was what was happening, because people were billing in different ways, they were charging for things that other people weren't charging for, and it created all kinds of problems for this company and relationships with their customers. And then uh, what they decided was needed was a common enough approach. There was a deficit of a common enough approach, so everybody was doing their own thing. Um, that everybody adheres to, and forgive me looking at this because I have, got it by heart, to bring clarity, transparency, and fairness. Yeah. And once they got that clear, yeah, and it was a difficult conversation for them because some people didn't want to talk about it, some people didn't know about it, others were so angry about it, and by getting back to the basics of what was happening and needed, they were able then to interact with that and decide how to proceed. Okay? And what came out of that actually was a collaborative proposal forming where they came up with some basic constraints that would enable them to evolve a more transparent way of doing these things together. And they were very happy about that. Um, another example, I just wanted to introduce a, an opportunity-focused driver. So we have considerable resources and the potential to further utilize our production capacity. This is a, a manufacturing company in Russia that manufactures chemicals and products for the oil and gas industry. And by their own admission, it's like it's a pretty, a pretty kind of a, how can you put it, corrupt 
environment to be in. And they've got a very progressive founder who just recently gave over 90% of the company's shares to itself and created the first company in Russia to own itself. It's not a people-owned company. It's a, the company owns itself and people become stewards of the company and has found ways to decentralize authority and invite people to take full ownership of the system to figure out what else can we do in the world. And so they want to develop new opportunities and innovate to make the best use of what they have. Yeah. Again, it was like unclear for them, like what's going on and what are the problems and what are the challenges. And we had long conversations to unravel things and we condensed it down into two sentences. Yeah. What's happening, the situation, effect or anticipated effect, what's needed, and the anticipated of impact of responding to that need. Not the truth, but a starting point. Yeah. Not the solution, but the thing needed. Begin there, decide, experiment, fail if you need to, evolve and learn. Not just your decisions, but what you thought was happening and needed. So that's driver. Um, now, the thing about drivers is, when you clarify a driver and you agree it's important, the next thing is you need to do something or you need to decide something. Yeah, so some drivers that you're responding to in your daily work, it's just stuff needs doing, right? It's like, oh, this is happening, this is needed. Yeah, don't know that, need to call James, for example, right? It's operational stuff. And there's organizing work as well. But on the other side is the governance. It's the making decisions that govern future decisions and actions, right? Decisions that constrain what happens to guide the creative flow in the way that you want it to go to create value. And, and that's another area that's really challenging for people, the decision making, right? Because when you need to decide across stakeholders with different perspectives, opinions, biases, preferences, interests, and so on, yeah, you need some kind of mechanism to arrive at something good enough. And we've got autocracy. It's like, well, damn it, I'm just going to tell you what to do because it's so much easier than letting you monkeys or talk all day about it, right? Or you've got majority. I've said this on this stage before, it's the most stupid idea in the world, not in itself, because like, okay, we can dot vote or we can see where the majority opinion is, but wisdom always emerges through the minority first, right? So if you can see to the majority always, you've just got a diminishing set of options over time. Uh, and consensus, consensus by unanim unanim unanimity. It's like we're all gonna agree with everything and we're just gonna spend our whole lives talking and talking and talking and talking and talking and talking and talking. And talking and not agreeing anything. I was in an elevator going from a workshop I ran here with uh, my, my wife and uh, co-teacher co, uh, Lily, Liliana. We were going down in the elevator after this workshop on decision making. It said, learn how to make decisions even in Sweden. <laughs> I loved it, it was great. <laughs> you remember that, you were in the elevator. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, because it's like, okay, let's be more pluralistic, inclusive, egalitarian, and not get anywhere, you know, because we're just trying to include everybody and in everything. Oh, sorry, include everything, everybody and everything all of the time. Um, so, is there an alternative? Supremacy to the individual or the small group? Doesn't work, especially in complex environments. Supremacy to the majority? Doesn't work, you lose the collective intelligence. Supremacy to consensus with unanimity doesn't work because the first person who says, I block, I don't like it, and it's not going to happen, even if it's unreasonable, becomes the dictator and you're back to autocracy. So supremacy to people, groups, and individuals is a problem in decision making, right? So <clears throat> I want to introduce the principle of consent. Can you raise your hand if you've come across the principle of consent from a sociocracy point of view? Yeah, okay. So let's see if I can define this for you. Consent, the absence of an objection, okay? Um, so the principle of consent says raise, seek out, and respond to, or raise, seek out, and resolve objections to decisions and actions, okay? So that begs the question then, okay, what's an objection? So it's an argument. You know, we don't teach our kids how to argue. We say, stop arguing. <laughs> it's like, what? The argument, like in the sense of arguing for why something might be the case, yeah, and being able to do that in a concrete and clear way for people. Um, an argument that demonstrates or reveals how a, an agreement or a proposal or some kind of activity is leading us to unintended consequences. Yeah, if you carry on like that, it's going to be really bad, and here's why, or it might be, and we don't want to risk it. Yeah. Or an argument that demonstrates that there's a worthwhile way to improve something. 
Yeah, people think of objection like something negative, but if you think of it as a gift, something that reveals a possible problem, like stop going that way, bad things are going to happen, or a possible tool, like keep going that way, good things might happen and we can improve it. Yeah, this is a more healthy way to think of objections. So the question is, and well, how do you know if an objection is true or not? How do you know if the argument is true? And this is the techie bit I want to try and nail, okay? And I'm going to run through it, and we share the slides afterwards so you can come back to it, okay? So listen to the argument. I'm going to look at this because I don't even remember how I constructed it. So listen to the argument. Check people understand the argument. Reflect, everybody. Do you think this argument qualifies as an objection? Does this argument reveal the potential for unintended consequences we want to avoid or a worthwhile way to improve? And does anybody disagree with this argument, totally or partly? Yeah, and this is the question. Because if you say, well, I've got an objection, and then you just say, OK, well, you've got an objection, so we'll just have to change everything now as a consequence, you're missing a point because the person might be a little bit off the rails on their argument. Yeah? It could be partly or entirely untrue. So checking, does anybody disagree, takes us down a layer. It's like, no, fine. Qualified. Seems good enough according to the collective intelligence of the stakeholders involved. You've got a point, nobody sees a problem with it, so we can act on that. But sometimes someone says, wait, I don't agree with you. I think you're mistaken, partly or totally. So what do you do about that? Well, you fight, right? <laughs> okay, fight. Yeah. Well, another way of doing it is kind of fighting, but it's saying, let's repeat the process. You disagree. Let's hear your argument. Yeah. Do people understand the argument? Reflect, do you think that argument counts as an objection to the first argument? And does anybody disagree with this argument totally and partly? Et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So you're using the collective intelligence of the people to bring the multiple perspectives, to empirically and rigorously take apart arguments and check that they're robust enough according to the intelligence you have available. So it kind of looks like this. You've got an argument, there's a disagreement, you hear a, another argument, you check, and maybe there's a disagreement again, and another argument, and you check, and there's a disagreement again, and suddenly you're like three layers of abstraction down, and you say, oh my god, there's another disagreement, so you're four layers down, and, and, and then somebody disagrees. Well, it's a little reassurance. In the last 18 years, I've experienced never going lower than level four, because either you misunderstood an earlier argument, or what happens is it comes back up because the last person says, no, I disagree with the person who's arguing against me. And so, a little trick, if you're in that situation and you can have the discipline to follow the process, then, oh, sorry, you can invite a time box conversation between those two people and say, there's something in both of your arguments, have a conversation and find the both and more argument. And then, once you've extracted the both and more, you come back up the stack again, integrating at every level, and finally, you want to check, listening to the original argument, is there anything left of it? And if there is, do people understand it? Consider if it still qualifies, and does anyone disagree totally or partly? And you'll arrive at the point where there's no more disagreement, and you've qualified the objection. Okay. So lastly, I just want to move on a little bit, because the last thing is, OK, well, we qualify an objection, but then what do you do? Okay. So resolving objections is another pattern from S3. Basically, you invite the person first to see if they've got any ideas how to change or amend the proposal or the activity according to their argument to resolve the objection. Usually, a person objecting has a lot to offer in terms of how const to constructively evolve something. And then, following a very familiar process now, check people understand the proposed amendment and check for any objections to the amendment. And if there are, process those possible objections in exactly the same way I just shared with you in the Resolve Objections pattern. So, if there's objections, propose an amendment to the amendment. <laughs> check people understand it. Check for any objections to the amendment to the amendment, etc., etc. At the end, you're going to arrive at a point where uh, objections have been resolved, you zoom out to the whole proposal and you go through the process again. And finally, you can celebrate some more because you've achieved a miracle. 
you've made an agreement together where all objections have been heard and integrated into the original proposal, and everyone has a sense of peace and reassurance in what it is that you arrived at. So, the final thing I want to share about that is good enough for now, safe enough to try it, is the best you can achieve in a moment, and it might be completely wrong. So, evaluate, yeah, reflect on outcomes, uh, evolve your agreements incrementally, learn through doing. And as a way to finish this, maybe with something a little more profound, it's not either or, it's both and more. I think I said in the talk just now that, that maybe I didn't last year, maybe, Ken Wilber saying nobody's smart enough to be 100% wrong. Now, of course, we can be mistaken, but what he meant by that was there's something of wisdom in everybody, right? And so what amazes me about intentionally proceeding with consent decision-making is it says we're going to suspend our biases and our opinions. We're going to fully show up with our perspective and what we believe to be true, and we're going to rigorously listen to others as well. We're going to hold the tension between apparently polarized and irreconcilable opposites. And in the creative space that emerges, give birth to holes that are greater than the sum of their parts. And that's my presentation to you.